auction because we're going to we're going to quiz him today about what his <laughs> politics are and we're trying to figure out his economics too i i, I think he i think he's uh, you know pretty good on the economics and I, I understand he's even heard of the mises institute and human action <laughs> and he writes books so so i want to welcome our special guest today david stockwell david say hello <laughs> Uh, good morning or good afternoon. I'm happy to be with you, Ron. And uh, we've been having this conversation for 40 years. So right. I think I'm we're pretty familiar with where uh, each other stands. And I think on some of the big issues of conservative economics, we obviously stand uh, very much together. And we have been, I would own since the very beginning. I would only know when you and I were in Congress in the late 70s, uh, you know, the federal deficit, the total uh, public debt was less than a half trillion dollars. Uh, here we are at 34 and counting rapidly. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, 72 fold growth uh, just in the period since we've been having this conversation. Yeah. I want to say hello, to Daniel. Well, I also want to mention that uh, our viewers, I'm sure, know that David is on our is on our board at the Ron Paul Institute so we're doubly happy <laughs> double yeah. plus good to have you here David so thanks for okay. joining us great and you got a new book out and that's one of the things we're going to talk about and we can put up that cover um, it just came out this month it's going to be it's, it's not going to be controversial <laughs> Trump's <laughs> war on capitalism uh, with a forward by RFK Jr brand new book out uh, David and congratulations on the book yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. It worries me when we have these wars on things. You know, I'm always <laughs> trying to stop them. So we, I guess we better stop the war on capitalism, too. <laughs> so, no, it's it's great to have you on the program. And I'm going to, I want to let, let our audience get to know David a little bit more because I have a few questions before we get to in the details of the war. And that is... Uh, uh, when David went to Congress and he sp and, and we were congressmen together, uh, I remember we were working closer and closer together. And I thought and we sort of had some casual conversations of our strategy because there were two of us. And yeah. uh, it turned out he says, "Ron, but I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be, you know, the budget director." I said, "Wow, I guess I guess I'll never see you again." <laughs> so, so uh, I wanted to find out. Uh, a, um, uh, how, how you look at it. I want to compare uh, Reagan and, uh, and, uh, and Trump. Uh, you worked for Reagan, you knew him, uh, uh, you, you did a, you know, people say you were responsible for that. Yeah. That, that. You know, the debt went up under Reagan. <laughs> so true. you have some responsibility there. And, uh, and now uh, you, you, uh, you work with Reagan and how, how do you compare uh, what, what you found with him and uh, what's going on with uh, Trump? Well, that, those are great questions. And I want to go back to your point about uh, you were suspicious of me way back then because <laughs> I had worked for John Anderson. And it's relevant here because uh, since I had worked for him before I was elected to Congress, the Reagan campaign decided in 1980 that when he was going to have a debate with John Anderson, who was running as an independent candidate, uh, that they better get him prepared. As you know, Ron, he was quite a debater. He was one of the most fluent guys on the House floor, even if you uh, might have disagreed with a lot of his positions. So they said, let's take uh, 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 Reagan off the campaign trail for a whole week, put him in a mock studio. Uh, let's have a panel raising, uh, asking questions, just like in the uh, debate that was upcoming. And let's have a stand-in for John Anderson, who might be able to replicate where he'd be coming from. So they chose me. <laughs> so uh, I became John Anderson for a whole week. Uh, Reagan got well prepared for the debate. I could see how he worked. Uh, he was uh, a great uh, actor and he had a sense of timing and exactly how to, uh, you know, use rhetoric, uh, political uh, uh, language effectively. And by the end of the week, he was ready to go. The expectations were very low for that first uh, Reagan Anderson debate. Uh, he came out much better than expectations. He was very happy about that because it uh, was late September. It uh, fueled his campaign. 
And the next thing I knew, a month later, I get a call from the campaign, come back, you're going to be Jimmy Carter for a week. <laughs> uh, he got, uh, and that was a much harder assignment, as you might well uh, mention. But uh, we got him prepared for the uh, Jimmy Carter debate. He practiced that famous line, there you go again, Mr. President, which really sort of clinched the debate. He won the election, called me a few days later, thanked me for the help uh, in the debate rehearsals and suggested I might want to be energy secretary. Oh, uh, David, let me ask you, do, do you think they were yeah. going to invite you to, uh, to, to do, have a session with RFK when he gets ready to debate Trump? Would you like <laughs> yeah. to do that? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'd be ready for that. Good point. Good point. <laughs> I've been talking to him and trying to convince him uh, on a lot of things that we believe in, and I think he's responsive. But in any event, um, he, uh, President Reagan said, we'd like you to be Secretary of Energy. You realize how bad it was back then. We had the Carter uh, uh, program. We were regulating everything, and we were subsidizing everything. Uh, and it was very tempting, but I told him I'd rather be director of OMB. He wasn't sure what the job was. He said, I'll talk to some people a few days later. He came back uh, and I got that job. Oh. Now, this is all by way of saying the first thing we had to do in January 1981 because of the legacy that we had, herit had inherited from Jimmy Carter and from Johnson and uh, everybody who came before was the public debt limit was being uh, threatened to be breached and it was one trillion dollars. We were at 980 or something <laughs> at that time. Now, you know, uh, I'm still here, Ron, you're still here. It's, uh, yeah. it's uh, you know, it's uh, been a while, but still it's in the lifetime of people who served back then. And yet we've gone from less than one trillion, which we were very, uh, afraid to breach because that was uh, like crossing a Rubicon fiscally and here yeah. we are today at 34 trillion and they're not even paying attention they're saying well let's have another uh, commission to see if we can study what the problem yeah. is the problem is spending the problem is the warfare state the problem is the welfare state and the problem is both parties have become I think kind of a single uniparty that are united on let's let the Fed print as much money as it would like, let's borrow and spend like there's no tomorrow, let's worry about the public debt someday down the road <coughs> and, uh, you know, uh, engage in politics as usual. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Trump was supposed to be the outsider the guy who rode in uh, from the north, from New York City, and was going to drain the swamp and uh, began to uh, reverse the direction. But when it comes to the core matters of economics, and that's why I wrote this book, uh, he basically was as bad or if not worse than almost uh, everybody who had come before, Democrat or Republican alike. Yeah. And, I, I talk about the four pillars in the book uh, of conservative economics, fiscal rectitude, sound money, free markets at home and abroad in terms of trade, and strict adherence to constitutional rights and civil liberties. Well, on those four <coughs> uh, core pillars, uh, you know, Trump made min mincemeat out of them. His record uh, is uh, among the worst. And so we could probably go through some of those items here today uh, because I think, uh, you know, he is not the answer to the huge uh, uh, problems that yeah. they all have Well, today. I, I think we'll get into that. But right now we're going to ask Daniel to come <laughs> up with a astute question. <laughs> now you have your chance. Well, it's interesting because, you know, it was really just about a little, little under eight years ago, a little over eight years ago that you uh, wrote another book uh, that was about Trump. Uh, so people yeah. might think that you've just got it in for him, you know. <laughs> um, uh, the timing is definitely uh, interesting. I think some people might say just playing devil's advocate, it looks like he's going to be the nominee. It looks like he's going to be up against Biden. And I would like to hear more uh, from you about your book, what, what led you to, to write it. But what would you say to someone that would say back to you, well, why would you do this now? Uh, when the op the, uh, you know, the, the other option would be, be Biden, who seems to be a lot worse? 
Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, actually, um, I had previously written three books <laughs> against Trump. The first one was Trump. Oh, yeah. The second one, uh, that was 2016. 2018, I wrote a book called Peak Trump. Oh. And then in 2020, I wrote another third book called Dump Trump. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I guess I must have figured that the fourth time would be a charm. And so I've tried once again. And it's all with the point of view of trying to alert, you know, um, Republican grassroots voters who I know mean well and are worried about the future of the country that when it comes to these four pillars of conservative economics, uh, Trump is not uh, remotely their man. Uh, in fact, he's made things worse. Now, the one uh, fact that I bring up, and we can go into many of these, but I think we start with this, is that when Trump became uh, was sworn in, the public debt was already $20 trillion. I mean, it was out of control after eight years of Obama. And frankly, we had the Bushes before that, and they weren't much better. Uh, but the point is, it was $20 trillion when he came in. When he left, only four years later, it was nearly $28 trillion. So that's $8 trillion worth of public debt racked up, generated uh, in barely four years. Why is, now that's obviously a big number. It's almost hard for any normal person uh, to uh, grasp, but here's a good way to look at it. The, ask the question, uh, uh, when did we get the first eight trillion of public debt equal to what Trump did in four years? The answer is it took us 216 years and 43 presidents from the beginning of the nation up through 205 to generate a trillion of public debt. Uh, <laughs> Trump rec replicated that uh, in just four years. So that, that gives you some sense that this wasn't just a, a little bit of overdoing it. It wasn't a little bit of uh, excess when it comes uh, to fiscal, um, you know, uh, 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 excess, it was uh, off the charts. It was a thundering uh, setback uh, for uh, everything uh, that we think is important. Because after all, the public debt is just the reflection. It's the embodiment of all the projects and spending and interventions and um, uh, activities of government that shouldn't be happening or should be happening in a much smaller or more efficient way or at the state and local level. Right. David, David, how would your approach be now if they call you up and they got hold of one of those uh, videos of you teaching people how to do debates and they say, uh, what what should we do now? You did, you were deeply involved in supply side economics and Reaganomics and some good came of it, but we, we really ended up, we didn't change our course. Yeah. It was just, uh, it continued. Why, why does it fail? And uh, why, why is it that, uh, you know, we're back to where, where we are. Would you, if you were asked to be the advisor now and they say, well, you did such a great job, you know, on Reaganomics, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to do the same thing with Reagan. What would you say? Well, things are different now. Uh, how, do, how do we get them to quit spending? Because I think that, you know, if we don't change this attitude, the appetite for spending by the people, if you don't have fiat money that monetizes the debt, uh, I don't see how, uh, it, technically, if you go to the Congress and say, do this, do that, uh, the, the pressures are there. Uh, it's automatic but for, by human nature and the warmongers, they're going to spend the money. So it seems like the technical approach, and I think Reaganomics and uh, supply side economics was a technical thing that more or less uh, was not going to work if you didn't change the people. Yeah, well, the, you know, um, I would say maybe there's four uh, slogans I would use. One, bring the empire home. Two, shackle the Fed. Three, uh, balance the budget. And fourth, uh, you know, start observing the Constitution once again and uh, distribute the powers of government that are legitimate among all three levels of government, not uh, centralize and concentrate everything in Washington. 
Now, uh, if someone uh, challenged those principles, I would say, one, they're pretty well uh, based on uh, history, and secondly, they're based on some big lessons that we learned during the Reagan era. We failed, uh, he failed to shrink uh, the Leviathan on the Potomac, uh, even as he wanted to very much, because unfortunately he was a, a small government man <laughs> domestically, but when it came to the Pentagon side of the Potomac, he was, uh, he was the biggest spender that ever came down the pike. And so what happened was uh, there was a huge defense buildup during those eight years. We went from Jimmy Carter's already bloated defense budget of $140 billion to $350 billion within eight years. Uh, you know, uh, almost a tripling of the defense budget. We didn't need that. The Soviet Union was on its last leg anyway, and quick, and very soon thereafter fell apart. It was due to the fact that communism doesn't work, that centralized command and control economies fail, not because Washington was wasting a huge amount of money on defense. Most of that uh, money ended up going not into strategic weapons anyway, but into building up the conventional forces, you know, new tanks, 600 ship Navy, uh, more planes and helicopters and uh, other, um, you know, uh, defense weaponry than you can imagine. None of that was really needed. Uh, to combat the Soviet Union because before the decade was over it was gone but once it was put into being, once it was funded, procured and put into uh, operation, it was a easy way for presidents to be tempted uh, to intervene and occupy, intervene in uh, conflicts and occupy nations uh, all over the planet and rather than when the, the Cold War ended, uh, bringing uh, you know, the empire home, uh, closing the bases and getting back to kind of a fortress America defense, which is all we needed, uh, that huge Reagan buildup uh, became available for presidents of both parties uh, to launch these forever wars and get us into yeah. the mess we're in today. So uh, the first point then is bring the empire home, cut the defense budget almost in half. We could go back to 400 billion from the 900 billion we have today and it would still be enough to maintain our strategic deterrent and to protect uh, the shoreline, the air, uh, airspace, and uh, fully fund um, <laughs> what I think is a far more appropriate concept, which is Fortress America, use the great Atlantic and Pacific moats uh, to provide uh, the inherent protection that is there. There's no country in the world that could launch a big enough armada, uh, you know, to uh, embark on the shores yeah. of New Jersey or California. Well, 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 David, you know, I, I would say that's a good start. <laughs> yeah. I think I think uh, Daniel is itching to ask you another challenging question. Yeah. Well, as, okay. as as you say, Dave, I mean, what happened is you had people like Madeleine Albright who famously said, "Well, what's the use of having this great military if we don't use it?" <laughs> exactly. So when you have it, <laughs> and, and, and you know the qu the point there, uh, Daniel, is that she wouldn't have been able to ask that question or do that if it hadn't been put into being in the 80s if you know if they had to go if bush uh, the senior bush or clinton had had to go to the congress for huge increases in defense spending and taxes to go with it in order to expand NATO when we promised Gorbachev that we wouldn't and uh, to intervene multiple times in the Middle East, uh, in, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, wars uh, in uh, Iraq, uh, twice, uh, Libya, all the rest of them. None of this, in my view, would have happened because the ways, the military means wouldn't have been there. So it was, it had a pretty uh, unfortunate, long lasting legacy. So the lesson we learned uh, is you got to bring the empire home, right. <laughs> smash the defense budget, and then get the Fed out of the business of monetizing the public debt. And that's uh, uh, another uh, big uh, reason why Trump is not uh, the answer to our problems. He spent four years harassing the Fed, demanding even lower interest rates, which were already practically zero, complaining when they tried to begin shrinking their, um, you know, bloated uh, balance sheet, which had gotten to four and a half trillion, 
um, and uh, you know basically uh, 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 push the Fed into an even more uh, dangerous, uh, reckless inflationary policy. David, I okay. wanted to, before, be, we're getting low on time now, but I did want to ask you about one current event because I know you do a lot of writing. Your stuff is always very insightful. It's always so well documented. Uh, before we do, I just want to note one thing, um, which is I saw you got in a dust up with Bill Browder, who's one of the, <laughs> my least favorite people on earth. And I loved your response. I won't say it on air, but it yeah. was a great response. He's a <laughs> real creep. Uh, but I want to ask you about Yemen. You wrote about the folly of President Biden's um, dust up with the Houthis. You said, I think it was a week or so ago at least, that this right. is not going to work. This is a disaster. Well, Congress has not been involved at all. You're finally seeing some people <coughs> waking up in the Senate saying, what the heck is going on? Um, yesterday uh, was an amazing event, which is that the U.S. Navy attempted to escort two Maersk uh, shipping uh, uh, yep. ships with military equipment on it for Israel. The Houthis, even after nine bombings, they launched an attack on it. And not only did the ships turn around and go back, but the U.S. Navy turned around and went back. Something tells me, David, that this is not going as they had hoped. Yeah. What is your take on how things are going there? Well, it's not going as anyone would hope. We shouldn't be there. The Red Sea is not a pond in our backyard that we need to uh, safeguard and monitor. Uh, if uh, because of the fallout uh, and the conflict between the Arab states and uh, countries aligned with Iran and Israel at the moment, uh, the Red Sea uh, Suez Channel of Trade is uh, disrupted. Well, that's 6,000 miles from China to Europe. If they have to go around the Cape uh, of uh, Africa, that's uh, 9,000. It's a little bit extra cost. Uh, and it's not our job uh, to uh, be the policemen of the Red Sea or the Persian Gulf. We shouldn't have any of the forces that are there now in harm's way. You know, uh, the one thing that Trump did try to do, uh, but there, <laughs> it was uh, basically uh, get us out of some of these situations in the Middle East. But when it came even to Syria, which was ridiculous, why do we still have forces in Syria? Several uh, thousand. He couldn't even get that done because even though he ordered it to be done, nobody paid attention right. uh, to uh, what he was saying. So now they're there. This conflict is going on. Uh, they're uh, sitting ducks to be attacked. And then you have the usual uh, suspects in Washington saying, well, we got to retaliate because, uh, you know, America Americans are being harmed. Well, right. when you put yourself in harm's way, you're going to be harmed. And the answer, <laughs> you know, the answer is not to uh, escalate the conflict. The answer is to get the hell out of there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just right. uh, uh, part of the whole uh, sequence. The reason why we need to bring the empire home and get these bases closed, get these aircraft carriers put in mothballs. You know, we don't need aircraft carriers. If we were, if the Russia is really a big threat to us, remember our GDP is 26 trillion, theirs is two, so I don't know why you would figure that. But uh, we've got 12 aircraft carriers, uh, aircraft ba carrier battle groups with all their escort ships and planes and so forth. They cost billions and billions a year to run. What does Russia have? They have one aircraft carrier <laughs> that's been in dry, da dry dock for the last three years and doesn't even have a, a modern system uh, catapult to launch. Uh, fighter aircraft. So when you look at the facts in the world, um, uh, I think you come down on the side of what in the world are we doing other than uh, allowing the military industrial uh, intelligence uh, complex uh, uh, to uh, continue uh, to, um, you know, uh, put enormous fiscal burdens that uh, on us that we can't afford. David, we, we're going to finish up here soon, but I do have a question because I'm fascinated with uh, people's uh, ideas and where they originated, how they might change. And I think you mentioned how long we've known each other. I think it's like 48 years. And you went right. into Congress in 76 is the year I went into Congress the first right. time. And uh, what I'm always fascinated with is uh, was there an event that said, that said, 
hey, you, you know, we can't, in a way, uh, to talk about John Anderson, but as time went on, you know, I had a lot of respect for him, but uh, we still saw him as a liberal. Was there an event that struck you and say, you know, maybe I don't have this ironed out yet, you know, uh, maybe I have to change, change this attitude. Was there an event or an individual, because I think uh, you would not uh, uh, d disapprove of me saying yeah. you are a libertarian non interventionist you believe in liberty and you right. challenge it and you uh, express it so well are there is there an event or an individual that you think uh, influenced you in that transition well there was an event Ron and I'm glad you bring this up and I was a young staffer I started in 1970 uh, working for John Anderson uh, I was staff director of the Republican uh, caucus and um, when Nixon closed the gold window and declared a national emergency and then had John Connolly out there telling the rest of the world, the dollar is our currency and your problem, and then they imposed comprehensive wage and price controls on everything. I mean, rent controls, profit controls, price controls on everything. You might remember that. That was 1971 and it went through to, I think, 1974. But I was in charge of research, among other things, for the Republican caucus in the House. And as we got into all of the disruption and, and um, you know, just uh, irrationality that was unleashed by the uh, Nixon program across the board, uh, you know, I started to read uh, some conservative economics to try to figure out how in the hell this was happening. And I think that was really the Rubicon I crossed uh, in the early uh, 1970s. The other thing is uh, I found that it was helpful to John Anderson on social issues. He was a bit of a liberal, as you say, but on economics, he was pretty solid. And that, uh, you know, kept the, the caucus uh, reasonably uh, satisfied with his leadership. Very good. We are going to close. Uh, this has been a great uh, interview. Uh, we're very glad you could come on, David. And uh, before we leave, uh, why don't you tell our viewers the most easy way where they can find your book and whether it's Amazon or some other place. And, yeah, uh, go yeah. Ahead. Well, thank, <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, uh, it's in the usual uh, places. Uh, it's on Amazon, uh, very easy to order. There's the... Uh, there's the cover, uh, Trump's War and Capitalism. Uh, we didn't get into the fact, very interestingly, that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. has uh, written a, a forward to it, but I think it's indicative of the fact that here we are 40 years later and people from both sides of the spectrum are coming together because uh, even he believes we can't borrow our way to prosperity and he believes we got to bring the empire home and he was shocked by the lockdowns and the shutdowns that occurred uh, during the pandemic uh, so uh, there's a lot um, of hope that maybe a new alignment uh, uh, can come together right. <laughs> as we go forward. Okay, and once again, David, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and I'm sure our viewers uh, enjoyed the program. And to our viewers, uh, thank you from uh, the uh, Liberty Report, and please come back soon. <laughs>